Might as well. Okay, recording now. Cool. Great. Well, welcome everyone to East West Hurricane. As you know, we're here to talk about things that are happening in Asia that most people in the West don't know about. So today we have a very good friend of mine, Ken Uehara, on the podcast. And hello, hello. Ken, Ken is a award-winning filmmaker. He is half Dutch, half Japanese. He grew up in Manila in the Philippines. And while he lives in London right now, he's a very, very global person. And I, I have a lot of respect for Ken, both his work in the cultural fields, like in film, having worked places like Unilad, currently at Unidays, and also from Ken's perspective. He's a very well-traveled guy. He's seen a lot of the world. And I'm really, really excited to get his perspective on things. So Ken, for our inaugural video podcast interview at East West Hurricane, could you please introduce yourself? Tell us your life story. Hello, hello. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for uh, having me on. So yeah, I was, uh, I was born in Manila. So I'm born and raised. And I lived there for about 15 years, going to international school in Manila, making lots of friends, getting that Asian experience, loving that anime, Asian food, everything to do with that. Um, but yeah, so I definitely grew up as what they call third culture kids now. Dad's Dutch, mom's Japanese. They don't speak each other's language. So my first language was always English. And do you speak um, Japanese or Dutch fluently? Or I speak Dutch fluently and I speak schoolgirl Japanese. Good enough to kind of order food in Japan and ask for directions and, and talk about how my summer vacation was. Uh, but unfortunately, not yet good enough to live there. It's, my, it's one of my life goals. Nice, I'm going to get nice. there. Um, so yeah, grew up in the Philippines, uh, really loved it. But then my brother went to university in the UK. So my mom and I kind of followed him across there. And then I posted up in London, went to school in the UK, and I've kind of been there ever since. But as Anthony said, you know, half of my whole heritage is in Asia. So I've always kept a close eye on that. I go back as often as I can, mostly to Japan. Um, but, but yeah. I do still feel very strongly connected to my Asian half as it is. And can you tell us kind of a bit more about um, the stuff you do in the film industry, if I'm not mistaken, like you've had a pretty impressive career from, in my opinion, about doing things related to film, culture, and can you explain a bit more about what you do right now as well? Absolutely. So I did film at university. And then after that, I was kind of working freelance in London, doing bits and bobs, lots of corporate film, uh, I've done some wedding videography, which was something else, um, you know, and through the whole time kind of making short films, music videos. I did a uh, web series called Kingdom of Evan, which was kind of some of my most successful stuff. Uh, I won a few awards for that. Um, and then eventually I got a job at Unilad, uh, which is kind of a big, big social page. So I was doing video editing, video directing for them, both branded and original. So I was doing that for a couple of years. And then now I've moved on to uni days where I'm the senior video producer there again, branded and original, but I've kept doing more, you know, short films, creative work. Just now the last thing we did was called urban stories. And it's kind of like, uh, like an urban myth, horror story. And, mm -hmm. uh, I directed that, and it's actually finally now getting some traction because actually a lot of it is being, it's, it's kind of like a urban story around a, a black person being persecuted and kind of targeted by a, a white um, evil woman kind of figure. And all of a sudden now it's kind of picking up traction, which oh, wow. is, makes total sense given the circumstances that we live in. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, uh, I definitely enjoy it. I think I've taken, kept a focus on social media in the last couple of years in terms of video production, uh, which initially I wasn't crazy about because obviously when I studied, you know, I was always like cinema, 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 yeah. you know, Martin Scorsese and all that. And I think there's a lot to that world, of course, but social media video is endlessly fascinating. You know, there's so much, you know, change in it and, and all the most exciting new developments are coming from it. And, uh, and in a lot of senses, there's no distinction now between online video, social mm -hmm. media, video adverts, let's say, and, and traditional forms like TV or, or, or uh, cinema adverts and stuff. I went for lunch for a guy who works at a, a traditional creative agency the other, a, a little while ago. 
And he said these days, like those walls, they don't really exist anymore. Like, and if he was advising someone to upgrade their skill set to get into those kind of industries, it's learn how to use social media, learn how to produce video for social media, because that's the kind of only thing that's growing. Everything else is staying stagnant or falling back. Yeah. Well, actually, um, not that this is directly Asia related at this point, but I'd love to, to dive deeper into that. So when it comes to social media video, are there certain platforms that you're interested in? Because as, as you know, and some people who read this know, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of TikTok and TikTok symbolizes the very first social media, though the company and people refer to more as an entertainment platform. It's a, it's a Chinese company, at least for now, and mm -hmm. we'll see what happens next. <laughs> and it's taken over the West in ways that no other Asian tech company has ever had before, but I don't think it'll be the last. Uh, but is TikTok something that is big in what you guys are doing at Unidays? Absolutely. I mean, we cater, our, our, our audience is mostly Europe and America. We've just started Unidays India, um, but that's still really? it's very, yeah, yeah. That, oh, that's I think cool. The, oh, the only things we offer there right now are Apple and Spotify. No, are Apple, Apple Education, Apple Music. Okay. Because I think that was just it's a very easy way to get in there. Um, but I know that I know they're looking at expanding. I mean, at that market, the amount of students there would be, uh, you know, unimaginable. Anyway, but we mostly focus on EMEA and uh, America, which means that in terms of social media video, we focus more on the social media uh, platforms that are kind of preeminent there. So. Instagram mainly for our younger audience, and then a little bit of Facebook, YouTube, but definitely in the last year, year and a half. I mean, I remember even I, I, maybe my timeline isn't isn't right here, but two years ago there were already rumblings of TikTok, and then all of a sudden in the last year it exploded, and I am a huge fan of it. I think it's so fascinating. I think it is. It's one of those ideas that. You know, it's not just an iteration. It wasn't just another Instagram stories. You know, it wasn't just another YouTube. Because I think that's the problem. A lot of new apps have come along and they haven't offered something new. They just try and get the slice of the same pie, whereas TikTok made their own pie. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's very exciting. I think there's a lot of untapped potential because I see right now a lot of adverts on TikTok are just kind of resized adverts for for 16 by 9 or for traditional media. And I think that makes sense if you're if you're a company and you just want to get your presence felt on TikTok, you know. As Willie Allen says, 80% of life is just showing up. So I think it's not a terrible idea. But for me it's more the the not manipulation but creating trends, creating content that works as shareable remixable content that is in its own way an advert that's how you're going to get people that's how you're really going to create the next huge tiktok ad um because especially with i'd say companies that are willing to take more risk if you create something offbeat something you know classic gen z millennial they won't care if it's an advert there's a kind of that's a, there's that nihilistic streak in in our generation that you know, we'll see something as nakedly, you know, uh, greedy or whatever you want to call it as creating a, a fake trend for TikTok. And they'll say, well, you know what made me laugh? Yeah, I'm going to get on board. Yeah, um, that's that's interesting because no, TikTok is very, very cool. Yeah, I, I think TikTok's part of this trend that is even bigger in China with regards to content and commerce being like one thing. It's like, mm -hmm. con like, well, for, for example, I actually wrote an article recently about this Chinese reality TV show called Four Try. And it's about mm -hmm. these like Chinese celebrities who uh, are tasked with selling a lot of clothes at this uh, boutique store in Tokyo. Um, so it's like this mixture of like music also with fashion. And the sponsorship is so like blatant and obvious. It's like, let us go to our Vivo phone and take a Vivo <laughs> photo of the day. And I'm sure it happens mm -hmm. to some degree in the West, but like, I think from my understanding in Chinese culture, that's a lot more acceptable. Like it's not, people are less mm -hmm. like turned off by that. But also if you look at social media right now, like live streaming is such a huge thing in China. People are live streaming everything from like lipstick to mm -hmm. um, selling rockets to selling uh, literally everything. And yeah, you, I think it was on your thing as well. They were selling like produce or something. Like you have like rural farmers in China yeah. and like, like yeah. in, in the countryside who literally get a phone. So it's all mobile live streaming 
and then they get like an apple like oh here are my apples from my <laughs> my apple uh farm <sighs> collection and they can yeah. ship them to people all around china and it's in a way it's like if you think about that like an e-commerce live stream is basically just i'm just selling you my apples right it's not like mm. uh but of course to make it not so blatant i'd be like well here's my story my apples are passed on from the fifth generation of the mcguire family apple farmers mm. and mm. i really need you to buy these and it's beautiful so it's like content and commerce there's like it's not so separate it's like you could buy it directly from me on that live stream well you know like uh content which is you know a horrible marketing term for maybe what we should call culture i yeah. guess this is my film studies thing coming through uh it's always been inseparable from from money you know like like renaissance painters being sponsored by merchants um you know this idea that they are separate is yeah. is uh it, it's not true. It's not true. I, I don't think there is. You, you cannot have art without money, you know? That's true. I mean, I, I think K pop is another good example. I think recently the Korean government said that K pop as an industry is, I don't know, like contributed to like a certain percentage of the country's entire GDP. And like yeah, BTS absolutely. has been attributed to like a billion dollars worth of sales. And Korean related products, but that might bring us actually onto the first question here for you, Ken, um, mm. given your cultural background and understanding and everything. Uh, what do you think are the most exciting trends happening in Asia right now? It's, it's a perfect segue. I agree. I think the most exciting trend that I'm seeing for me, I'm personally interested in is Asia becoming more of a cultural powerhouse. So I think there's always been a certain type of culture and certain type of people who have looked to Asia, you know, anime fans, uh, film buffs, but it was always very niche, you know? Um, and I think it's high time that just like we all use Asian products in our day to day, you know, we can't imagine life without our, our phones or yeah. our cameras or our computers. Like it, it should be, why, why can't Asia do that for culture? So 2018, Crazy Rich Asians, which was like one big advert for Singapore, yeah. you know, it made big bank, in America mostly, but all over the world, you know? And that was a movie, there was nothing special about it except for the fact that it was in Asia and it was starring Asians. And I think that's wonderful. It didn't have to trade on any kind of like oppressed minority thing. It was just Asian and it didn't matter in a sense. Uh, then 2019, Parasite, again, kind of a critical favorite, but I think it entered the cultural zeitgeist in a way that other films simply haven't like you can make memes about it you can make yeah. jokes about it you know um and it was a great movie it was the best one i saw in 2019 and now 2020 i think they've already been big for a long time but bts tiktok yeah. you know it's it's all getting up there and you know i'm going to segue into this with crazy rich asians and bts we're finally seeing sexy asians on our screens you know yeah. and i think that's so important yeah. uh i say all the time I see a sexy Asian every time I look in the mirror, but I think <laughs> everyone should have that opportunity yeah. um, because it's just not, it's just not been a thing. It's, you know, you've been very much relegated to certain parts, certain ways people look at us. Um, and I yeah. think that's a very encouraging development. You know, that's, that's a good point actually. Cause I think about when I think about Asian portrayal in media, like the first thing I thought of was like Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Right, you know, mm. like that, which is hilarious, great film, but it's not like the sort of alpha male hero's journey that you get in other no, exactly. non-Asian material, which is another reason why Black Panther was so, even though Black Panther wasn't about Asia, it's, it's about representation, right? That stuff, that shit yes. really does matter. Absolutely, absolutely. And are they, I mean, is there gonna be a, an Asian superhero film, film coming out soon? I, I think there, there must be, um, I'm not 100% sure, but I know that, that is overdue. Yeah, well, I, I think Marvel and DC and all the, the comic book brands, they're investing in, in that for the next generation of films, I believe, but I'm not, I don't know yeah. the specifics, you know. Because you think that's, that's, that's money on the table. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, Mulan isn't a superhero and that wasn't necessarily received that well, depending on who you ask, but that's, yeah. it's a superhero like Asian character, right? Yeah, yeah, I think, and also in Mulan, they really upped the kind of superhero uh, yeah. In her, they gave her like cheap it, hours. I haven't because okay, I don't have Disney Plus or thirty dollars to burn. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure I'll, I'll see it when it comes out. Yeah, uh, in a more easy way. Yeah. 
Uh, so coronavirus, you've heard of it, I'm sure. Yes, How has it affected your company, your business? What's going on? Is health check on what's going on? Uh, so we're very lucky. And I know that's not true for a lot of people out there, but coronavirus has not yet affected our business very much. Uh, Q2 this year was our best quarter ever. Um, so, and obviously that was still in what I like to call the good times of coronavirus when we were all uh, watching Tiger King and buying stuff. So, you know, we'll see how, how the rest of the year pans out. But I think we're lucky because A, we, the main, the main business model of Union Days is we offer discounts on products. And yeah. when money is tight, people love discounts. And number two, we offer discounts on so many different types of services and products. So that means we're quite flexible. So for example, P people are buying less clothes because you only need two pairs of sweatpants uh, every week. But that does mean then that they buy more maybe uh, tech items, you know, to, to, so they can actually, when they watch TV, they're not doing it on a shitty screen. They've got nice noise canceling headphones or uh, food box services because they're spending a lot more time at home. So they want to cook better meals for themselves. And these are all things that we obviously offer discounts on. Um, so that means that we have that flexibility to whatever, whatever the new need it is that comes up because of coronavirus, hopefully we'll be able to, to, to offer a discount on that. Look, a long-term recession, people buy less, that's going to affect us, yeah. of course. Um, but, but for now, we've been, touch wood, relatively uh, insulated from that. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, so like Unidays, um, how it actually works, it's you guys are basically a, a content platform, but you have an app that is used by students. It's like a discount deal app, right? Yeah. So the app is where students can get the discounts on. They go on and they see, oh, uh, you know, uh, Amazon Prime is offering a student discount. I can get the code directly from the app. Um, and what happens for the video content is we promote deals by clients or we just if uh because we've got a lot of student on our database of course and we can reach them through email through the app through our social media platforms if the 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 company has a product that they want to push or 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 a new discount then they can come to us to create bespoke video content for that um, so we're doing a couple of unboxings for for dell i think coming up because they have new laptops oh, cool yeah that's great well going back to to Asia and your experiences there. So you lived in the Philippines for most of your life. Uh, obviously, yep. you've got strong family connections in Japan. Now, whether it's about Asia as a region or about the Philippines specifically or even Japan specifically, do you feel like people outside of Asia un misunderstand certain things about that country or those regions? I think so. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think uh, a really quick one is that, and I think this has been mentioned before, but the scale of Asia, people still don't get it, you mm. know? Uh, well, Indonesia is like, what, 200 million people? I think so. Uh, and, and it's going to be, I think, at the current growth rates, it's going to be the f fourth or third biggest, I think, fourth biggest country in the world population within the next 10 years. So it's, exactly. it's the speed or, of growth as well, not just the current It's the, the speed size. of growth. Yeah. Or the Philippines as well. That must be, I don't know. 100 million, put, I think. 100 million yeah. at least. Yeah. So you put those two countries together, you're, you're approaching the same size of Europe. And these are two countries, two yeah. relatively not high on people's imagination countries. So the scale is one thing for sure. And, but then I think the, the funny thing is people also have a more, in a sense, unspecified unease about Asia. They're like, oh my God, Asia's rising. You know, Asia's rising. It's going to be bad for Europe. It's going to be bad for, uh, for America. Uh, and I definitely think Asian century, you know, it seems, it does seem inevitable, but on the same time, it's not like all the countries, all the people in Asia are clubbing together being like, yeah, yeah, I can't wait till we're on top, you know, because all these countries, they have, it's not, it's not a monolith, you know, they all have their own conflicts with each other. They have their own goals as nations and they have their own internal conflicts. A person in, in Indonesia is much like more likely to worry about what someone in Malaysia, what someone in the Philippines is doing than what, you know, what was going to happen to UK car manufacturers or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, you know, if you think of the rise of Asia, Asian centers, something scary, the good news is that they're not really thinking about you at all. Um, and, and uh, I think it's just a issue of, visualizing people in Asia 
as being kind of just like them, to be honest. Um, they all, if people go to on holiday to Spain, to France, to New York or something, they go there and they see, oh yeah, we're quite different. But in a lot of ways, you know, they're just trying to live their own lives. And I think people still lack that about Asia. Um, and I think that's obviously travels a lot harder and the cultures are quite separate still. So it's, it's harder to put yourself in those shoes. And that's why I think this rise in Asian culture is going to be great because mm -hmm. again, helps people see people as people. Totally. Well, from a, from a business side of things, are there certain companies that you admire in Asia? Yeah, definitely. So I do video production. So some, a lot of the kit we use is kind of old school Asian, a lot of Japanese stuff, Canon, Sony, um, you know, and, and, and great stuff, top notch. But two companies that have just come out of nowhere from China and just dominated the markets are in. So that's DJI mm. and Xeon. So they both do these kind of electronic stabilizers and DJI are more famous for their drone technology. And they dominate this. No, no one does it better for that price point than DJI and Zion. Um, and, and it's amazing what it's done. Like everyone can now afford totally stabilized footage on their cameras, on their phones for, for $400, you know, like this is not quite, but mm. the same shit that Stanley Kubrick was, you know, using in the shining, yeah. but two kids down the street making TikTok videos have the same ability now. Um, and the fact that. I think who do those um, GoPro, right? Yeah. They were market leaders in these little crash cams and they recently tried to get into making their own drone and it totally bombed. They could not compete at all. Like it's not a case of, of, Oh, you know, the, the China, they make the low end drones, but if you really want a good drone, you have to go to Germany, you have to go to America. That's okay. not the case at all. Yeah. Like, uh, if you want the best, you go to, you go to DJI. So, um, so it's the, it's the high end video, like, and cameras and that's the stuff that it's I think not if you want to go high, high well. end, mm -hmm. you can probably find something that's also say American made or German made, but for 80% of the drone users out there, 90%, the best you're going to get is these DJI stuff. And, and yeah, that's, that's not an advantage that I think is going to go away. Okay. That's great. Well, um, what do you think is the single most important piece of advice you give to someone right now, considering the world we live in from a, an Asian <laughs> perspective and a, a life health danger perspective, we're recording this as I believe the news just came out a couple of hours ago that Donald Trump, yep. president Donald Trump has tested positive with the coronavirus. So I, I don't foresee the coronavirus not being an important part of our lives for a long time. So yes, um, definitely. And, and against the backdrop of the Asian century, wh what are your, your like high level thoughts on, on, on reflections on this? I, it's a big question. Yeah. It's a big question. Uh, there's this quote I love. Uh, it says the crisis is because the old is dying and the new cannot be born. Uh, and I think we're kind of in the middle of this crisis right now with coronavirus. So the old, which is dying as thing, you know, restaurants, pubs, uh, stadiums, you know, they cannot exist in their current state, but so much, so much of our energy is focused in keeping them alive in a kind of half zombie state, you know, pubs where you can't get up to talk to someone, stadiums where everyone sits half empty, you know, but we don't know what the new is yet. We don't know what's coming to replace it. Uh, I think there's, there's things on the horizon for it, but we're still not sure and we're still holding on to the old. So I would say, I think my life, my, my advice for someone in this time and in the future is, but people don't want like a warmed over margarine version of the old. They're going to want something that's new, even if it's imperfect, which it inevitably will be. And, and if you can find out what that is, I think that's going to be the success. Um, and I know that's quite vague, but I think it's, it's definitely, it's worth mentioning. It's like, I know it's not Asian, excuse me, but in the UK, you know, when they offer government support 
to to industries, airline industry, car industry, whatever. I think you still have this idea. It's people in a factory you got to support. You know, mm-hmm. it's people digging up coal. It's people, uh, you know, farming wheat. But like you said, in Korea, they 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 look out for you know K-pop, and I know it sounds absurd, grants for pop stars or whatever. But we have to realize that these service industries, soft industries. They make money. They make value for people. You know, there's no reason that should be any less important for economies, for governments, for 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 societies than than anything else. Um, so yes, embrace the new. Yeah. Find out what it is, and and you know, don't try and hang on to things just because they've always been there, or or we think they've always been there. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Great words of wisdom there. Um, now I move on to the, the quick fire round here. So it's more, more fun, casual stuff here. And the first thing I want to ask you is, what is the best thing you have watched recently? It could be a film, YouTube so, video, whatever, whatever. I recently watched The Handmaiden by Park Chan-wook. Seen that? Uh, Korean director. Oh my God, I love this film. Uh, for people who haven't seen it, it's a erotic period drama heist movie thriller set in occupied 1930s Korea. Uh, and it is, it is such a rich film. And I mean that in every sense of the way, beautiful production value, kind of the best, you know, when you think of a period drama, it should look like this. It's not stuffy, it's rich, it's colors, it's these textures, you know? And it has that wonderful, dark, subversive, comedic streak that Korean cinema just nails again and again and again. Uh, and, and, uh, and no, it's terrific. And as for this podcast, it's actually based on a Welsh novel set in Victorian England. I didn't know so that. That is a real, it's a real coming. It's called um, Fingersmith, the, the yeah. original novel. So that's a real example of East West coming together. Uh, I'm sure the original novel is great. Um, but I think this adaptation really, really builds on it and yeah. Asianizes it in a way that is fantastic. That's, that's amazing because I actually first saw The Handmaiden at Secret Cinema in, in London. Uh, that's yeah, so. a perfect place to see it. So for those of you that don't know Secret Cinema, it's this incredible immersive theater experience where um, this company picks a film for like a limited run, a couple of months and creates like an entire world through it. Like, uh, they did Romeo and Juliet. They've done Moulin Rouge that I've been to. But for The Handmaiden, Blade basically, Runner. Blade Runner, it's tons of mm-hmm. amazing things. And for The Handmaiden, I don't think they told you what the film was going to be until you get there. So mm-hmm. I walked in, I was with two friends. And we're supposed to dress up in like tuxedos and like ball mm-hmm. gowns, uh, if you're a girl. And uh, walked in, it was this weird, like Korean-y themed silence. You were allowed to talk. I think um, no one was supposed to talk. So you're, you're told to like pass notes and that's it. And then we all sat down and I didn't know what to expect because I didn't know what the film was going to be. And it's a very intense, it, it's very a intense, very intense, kind of surreal out of body film. So I was sitting there in a tuxedo, um, like in this theater in, in East London. And that was an amazing experience. But because of that, that film has been forever etched in my memory. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I think it's on Netflix. Oh, it well, is? Netflix. Okay. It's Netflix UK, I think. I can't remember uh, where, where you saw it. But yeah, terrific film. Now, have you uh, read anything recently that you recommend? Yes. So I've read Circe by Madeline Miller. So it's a retelling of a, of a whole host of Greek myths told from the perspective oh. of the eponymous witch Circe. Uh, I think it's been characterized as a feminist retelling of the Greek myths, but I think that's a bit of a shallow reading of it because it's about about so much more. It's about mortality and immortality and, um, and birth and, and, more, and, you know, motherhood. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of very interesting, uh, there's been a lot of interest in Greek mythology recently. Stephen Fry has written a few books about it, um, A Thousand Ships. Uh, and I know it's, it's terribly Eurocentric to talk about these, okay. uh, but I think there is a reason why these stories have kind of traveled through an ocean of time to still to still speak to us now you know they definitely have a, an elemental quality in them and and no i think it's definitely worth reading that's great and how about for the final question something that you have listened to recently so i listened to a podcast called it could be ha- it could happen here and this is a 
podcast about a theoretical second American civil war. Uh, so this oh, was released heavy. in the more innocent days of March, 2019, yeah. uh, which isn't too long ago, but a lot of it still is, feels far too prophetic to be comfortable. Uh, and some of it is, is, is more uh, speculative, but it contains a lot of interesting history. It's about like urban warfare or how does political polarization come, come to be? You know, what does a civil war look like? It really draws from, because this, the, the, the author of the podcast, mm. he, he was a journalist in Syria during the civil war there. And just the, he, he really elucidates in a very interesting way why a civil war is so particularly destructive to nations that undergo them. Um, and yeah, you know, hopefully it's not too prescient, yeah. uh, um, but we will see. It's, it's, it's a, it's a well-researched, it's not, I wouldn't say it's alarmist because it's too well-researched for that. Yeah. Well, on that uplifting note uh, of positivity <laughs> and optimism for the future, which I think we should all have regardless, um, that is the end. I think we'll, we'll end here. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to have me. Thank you so much. <laughs>